My name is Rob Kiefer. Um, we're, gonna, we're here to talk about uh, just how we interact with each other um, as developers, as visual artists, as user experience designers, and as business, trying to come together and develop new and innovative products. I was talking to Doug earlier, and he was, Doug Elkhorn, he was saying that um, at Gaslight, they're working to try to figure this problem out also. I know a number of people are trying to figure this problem out of how to pull in, uh, the developers are trying to figure out how to pull in the graphic artists earlier. Uh, the graphic artists or the people who are working in uh, the visual aesthetics are trying to figure out how to get the developers involved. Uh, and business is always concerned, of course, about what, uh, if we're making money and do people like what we're doing. So I think this is a common problem uh, that a lot of folks are, are looking into from many different perspectives. Um, this is a workshop that we're going to do. So I'm expecting it to be interactive. Uh, I don't want to talk for two hours. You guys don't want to listen to me for two hours. So uh, we've got a, a few different exercises to work through. Most of today or the next two hours are going to be focused on uh, the user experience design and uh, the business. Because I was expecting that most people in the room are either going to be developers or uh, more of what I'm calling visual aesthetics. And I don't, I'm, I'm kind of categorizing that, uh, giving that a different term than designer because uh, my background is human factors engineering and industrial design. And so that can be design. Uh, a developer, when they go to do something and figure out a problem, they design a solution. When a graphic artist sits down and draws something, they're often, it's often called uh, design or uh, visual communication. So that term design is overloaded. So I came up with, uh, or I wanted to use the, uh, the term visual aesthetics to indicate the idea of coming up with color grid, um, maybe potentially HTML, outputs would probably be like Photoshop, those kinds of things, or HTML, potentially some CSS, maybe bleeding in a little bit into JavaScript programming. Uh, whereas developers are going to be the C-sharp, Ruby, uh, Java, hardcore folks. Um, so before I get started though, how many folks in the room are developers? Or you consider yourself like within the last year or so you've written code that made it into production? Okay, that's most of the room. How about um, graphics or visual communications? Okay, so that's pretty much everybody else. If you didn't raise your hand for the first two, no hand. Okay, we got one hand. <laughs> okay, okay, we got a couple. So, um, so this is good because that's kind of what I was expecting. Uh, so, I'm not here to talk about uh, development. Uh, you guys already know all that. I'm not here to talk about the visual side of things because you guys already know a lot about that. So, what I was hoping is at the end of this workshop, you kind of get a feel for user experience design as well as um, how the business works together. Stacy Sheldon is uh, a colleague of mine. She's going to be uh, working with me. Um, I think that mic comes off of there. Um, I figured that it was difficult to do a talk on collaborative teams um, by myself. <laughs> so I thought it should be, uh, it should be with, uh, I should collaborate to do a talk on collaborative teams. So this is our overview of what we're going to be talking about. Um, basically, what I want to kind of just to set up the topic a little bit is talk about where we've been. A few weeks ago, I took my family up to Dearborn, Michigan, which is uh, the home of Henry Ford. And there's a Greenfield Village there, if any of you have been there. It's kind of neat, uh, like an outdoor museum. Um, and uh, there was a lot of... Uh, of course, since it's the Henry Ford Museum, there's a lot of emphasis on Henry Ford and what he was up to, which I didn't really know, all of the different things that he was up to, but he's well known for developing the assembly line. And so he came up with his car, and then he figured out how to best manufacture this car in large quantities. And in uh, 1914 or so, they uh, produced 13 million Model Ts, and, uh, which was kind of surprising before the road and infrastructure system was really even in place. There were that many cars out. Um, and then they would sell them on showroom floors. Um, Henry Ford died in 1947 
before uh, Eisenhower came along and, and uh, developed the highway system. So he never saw this. What we take for granted, I remember my great grandfather talking about driving a car down into Tennessee and they would literally follow the creek beds because they didn't have roads. So the empty creek beds in the summertime turned into their roads for some of their cars back in the uh, 20s. So similarly, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So this, this whole idea of manufacturing takes a process. And unfortunately, we've uh, adopted a lot of this process in our silos uh, that we work in today. And we'll see that. I'll talk about more, more about that in a minute. Uh, this is Thomas Edison. There's many people. Whenever this slide comes up, uh, there's mixed emotion. Either you have no idea why you shouldn't like uh, Thomas Edison or you don't like Thomas Edison. So I'm just using him as an example. Don't throw stuff um, if, you, if you're in that camp of the Tesla crowd and all of that. Um, so, so, but what uh, Thomas Edison did is his whole focus was on innovating. Um, he had a whole lab of people uh, who were focused on innovation. He had employed chemists and um, uh, people to do the drawings for his patents and uh, engineers and, and uh, machinists and had a machine shop there. He had a whole um, power generator just for his lab area. He had a house where he would, uh, the young guys who were coming up could live if they didn't have any place else to live so that they could be there and work on his campus and, and focus on innovating. So while he's not well known for having thousands of patents, the reason that he has thousands of patents is that was his focus. Uh, so he came up with the movie camera and the light bulb, um, the manufacturer of the light bulb, the um, uh, voice recorder. And this um, this picture in particular is kind of interesting to me. This is actually the, um, the recording device down here. And what they did is he would manufacture just this, and this was pre-1900. They would t and then sell them to people who would go around to carnivals and have folks, um, they pay five or 10, 25 cents, something, uh, to yell into that um, megaphone there that would actually record their voice and then they could hear their voice back. And so talk about minimal viable product. <laughs> That's kind of a minimum viable product where he was able to go and sell that thing to carnival attendees and actually make a little bit of money uh, before you know, records and, and things like that. Um, he also had to create an infrastructure and so he had uh, power plants and, and whatnot. But what he didn't have, of course, was the Walkman. So uh, he would have never even seen this, right? The, the, the future was so far out to think of 1984, some kid out mowing the lawn listening to Journey on his Walkman, right? So um, those kinds of things weren't, weren't in, his, in his view. But, but the, his whole process takes an engaged crew. He needs a group of people who are working together uh, towards an end. And, and uh, they're all working in the same space. They're all working towards something. So the, unfortunately, what ended up happening is, uh, well, I'm sorry. So unfortunately, what ended up happening is we, we took a lot more of what Hen Henry Ford was up to than what Thomas Edison was up to. So it's difficult to think of something uh, that we use on a daily basis that doesn't include electricity or, or uh, an automobile. Then along came the computer. Now, we, uh, these first computers didn't really have much of an interface. They were designed and built by engineers, for engineers. Um, the interfaces were clunky at best and large. Um, we all think it's cool that we can use a stylus on our iPad. Um, they were using styluses back in the 60s on, on computers. Um, but these weren't usable in any way. And, and again, they were, they were four engineers uh, focused on, on um, what the uh, solving engineering problems. Um, I remember as, as around 1990, one of the first programs that I wrote uh, out of school was to do, uh, to 
make contour plots of smoke uh, out of a model that would be on a, on a um, that were being used by physicists rather than uh, what they would usually print out were large pieces of green bar paper and these physicists would literally pour over pages and pages of numbers to try to figure out this stuff. And so even, even at that point in time, it was kind of a, a new thing to be able to actually visually see how all of this stuff was, was changing. So it's really only within the last 20 years or so that we're starting to, to understand what a visual user interface means and how we're supposed to interact with that. It's, it's clearly not a solved problem, not like the production uh, or assembly line. So now we move into optimization over the last few years, the last 20 years, we still kind of have this whole siloed idea of design, build, and deliver, um, just like the, the production. Um, I just stole this off of uh, uh, Google Images, not to talk through it, but just, you all have seen this, right? We all kind of work in this environment where there's these stages um, that we have to work through, and it's often siloed. People don't interact. People aren't uh, even able to interact. I've, I worked with a company up in uh, Dayton where uh, they have all their engineers in one room and you have to have a certain uh, badge to even get into that room. And if you're not a software developer, you're not allowed in there. It doesn't matter if you're, a, if you're working with them on some project or anything. They're completely isolated. And that, to me, that's just crazy. I'd love to go into work someplace like that and see how quickly I could get fired. But um, they, uh, they, they're not about you know, collaborating in any way. So what drives people to, to, to do something like this? What's behind, why do we like to have this siloed and controlled and feeling of there's these measures along the way. Sometimes it's mindset. That's the way we've always done it. Okay. Yeah. That's the way we've always done it. It's inherited from the manufacturing. Right. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I just say it's easier to measure progress. I guess where you're at. Okay. Yeah. The, the people think that it's easier to measure pro progress. I think you can manage risk that way. Okay. Yeah. Risk avoidance. Okay, yeah, no, that's a good point. So in school, you're, if you're a CS major, you only know CS majors and you're working with them. If you're in visual communications, those are the folks you're hanging out with. Yeah, good. Other thoughts? Like a misattribution of where the costs are, right? So like to the legacy point where it used to be where it was really expensive to do the builds you wanted to design up front. Okay. Right, yeah, good. I would add to this, it's also a strategy to try to stick your head in the sand about the impact of change. Okay. Um, it's a strategy to avoid change. Right. And just kind of say, no changes. Yep, yep. <laughs> or if you do have to change something, you have to sign these 12 documents and get lots of people to approve. And Yep, yeah. It's also entrenched in where um, innovation ideas used to occur in a specialized Right. There was there used to be the almost the career path of you're you're this and then this and then this and once you get to the senior level of whatever you can be the idea guy because you've paid your dues. And, and <coughs> Right, okay, sure. Right. Yep. The, right, the interaction. Yep. This sort of model allows everybody to say that it's not their problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. No, it's, uh, yeah, that's very true. Go ahead. I would say something I find a lot is just the negative impact of some project. 
<laughs> right. Can't go back. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's true. Because it's so painful to change your Microsoft project that, that to embrace change would be extremely difficult. Yeah. Doug. Yeah, I think it's a little ironic that we, we call this command and control, right? Which comes from this military, this theory that you, you follow orders, you do what you're told, and it comes top down. But the military has abandoned that process a long time ago because it got people killed. Right. <laughs> and yep. business, nobody dies in business. Right. And maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe people die. <laughs> 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 but, you know, <laughs> but it's like the death they do what works in the military to change their model right. to be more autonomous cross-disciplinary teams. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, and it's interesting. Has anyone in here read the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell? A couple of you. Okay, there's a few heads done. If you remember in that in that story of um, a fellow who was a, a retired, decorated colonel, who they hired to be a, a renegade um, rogue leader. Uh, to test some of their theories. Do you guys, do any of you remember this story? I'll tell it anyway, just briefly. They, um, they uh, in 2002 or so, the military came out with a new doctrine, which, which to Doug's point, was full of this command and control type of thing in order to combat terrorism and to, to try to um, test their new doctrine they hired this fellow who had a PhD in military science and had uh, been uh, boots on the ground in Vietnam and had quite a career coming up through the army. And they uh, wanted him to be the leader of a terrorist cell. And so uh, they got their war game all set up. He got his guys all set up and they started the war game. Um, and within uh, three days, I think, he had sunk a third of the U.S. Army or U.S. Navy, and had wiped out like a, a large chunk of their forces that were in this game, and to the point where by the end of the week, the military came back to him and said, "Okay, that's not fair. We have to start over again." Um, but what what Malcolm Gladwell's point is in the book, as he's telling the story, is that this fella led through intuition. He understood what was going on. He had studied it. He had embedded those patterns in his head over 30 years of <coughs> experience and was able to uh, guess and outguess what uh, the US doctrine was going to do because of that training and through the intuition and through a lot of feedback loops and a lot of the things that uh, agile software development calls for he was do those types of principles he was incorporating into his military tactics. So as a result of that, over the last 10 years, a lot of that's changed. Uh, but yes, business is still slow to adopt. So the main point here is what drives this, I think, is fear. And you guys hit on it in different ways, right? Risk avoidance, blame shifting, those kinds of things. But really what's behind it is fear. We're, fear, we're afraid of failing because we have this large chunk of cash that we're going to try to invest in something and hope that it works rather than taking three weeks and starting down some path and see if that works and if we want to continue and having these very short cycles of being able to determine if we want to continue on or not. So in this, uh, so in this uh, world of lack of uh, collaboration, you may end up sitting in this seat uh, where somebody wasn't thinking, obviously, when they put that seat in, right? Um, uh, or someone may have designed this sign. This is in Boston. I don't know exactly. I was always riding a cab when I took this picture because I have no idea which way I was supposed to go <laughs> if, if I was. Uh, this is why I hate Walmart um, because the lack of trust, right, just causes you to, to mistrust who you're interacting with. Um, this is how you know if your UI sucks, right? If you, if just because somebody, somebody can use it doesn't mean everybody can use it. And if somebody comes along and redecorates your UI, you know that you might should go back to the drawing board. Um, Okay, so this, a buddy of mine took this shot. His, 
he's at a hotel with his wife and his little boy, two-year-old. Two-year-old goes into the, you can just imagine, two-year-old goes into the bathroom, slams the door open, turns around and slams the door shut. Two-year-old's locked in the bathroom, right, because the lock hit the little bumper. And uh, now they have to call down to the help desk to get the two-year-old out of the bathroom. So lack of systems thinking can lead to frustrated users. Uh, this is another shot that I took. The, I think the theme here is avoid hotels. Um, the, uh, so they had this nice stereo in there with a CD player and stuff, and that was the alarm clock. But you couldn't figure out how to set the alarm clock. And clearly, many people had had a hard time setting the alarm clock. So they've got the five-step process here to set the alarm clock. Uh, when I just saw the card, I didn't even bother. I just called it onto the front desk and asked for a wake-up call because that's just kind of silly. Um, yeah, who decides to do things like this? The uh, people just, you know, people make decisions outside of contexts and, and, uh, and then somebody implements it. I got to believe that the steamroller driver there is wondering who ordered this to be this way, right? This is my favorite. Um, you have to walk across the street backwards. Uh, inconsistent design leads to confusion. So, and where does all that come from? It comes from this whole uh, siloed thing, right? Where the guy who's saying, leave that post there in the middle of the road, clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. If he showed up there, and understood if the, engin the, the uh, engineer showed up there to understood what the context was and was engaged with what was going on, he would have moved that. But somebody's giving orders and not being fully engaged. And so this whole siloed thing takes effect in our world also in developing web apps. And sometimes we, uh, the, the visual uh, aesthetics folks work on their own and they're concerned about color and proportion and contrast and grid and making things look nice, something like this. The problem with this is it's, un, it's unusable. While it looks nice, um, it actually made it onto the top 10 list of uh, UIs that suck last year in 2011 because it, it looks nice, but when you click around and start to try to interact with it, the usability of it is terrible. So just because it looks nice, so these folks le left out UX out of their equation. Um, so from a traditional uh, development concerns, we're usually focused on uh, requirements and maintainability and, and all of that. And um, I have been a developer, I, I haven't done software development in a few years, but I have written for 15 years I was doing software development. So I understand this perspective a lot. And that is, uh, you often just get a list of requirements and you implement those requirements. So what's this site for? Does anybody know what this site's for? Video? Yes, it, it is for video, but it was said with a question, right? Because you don't know what this site's for. However, more than likely some developer, hopefully he's not in the room, got a list of requirements and implemented some set of requirements that were fulfilled in this, in this design. Uh, how about this one? Say, same idea, right? So clearly these, these developers are working by themselves. There's no visual aesthetics and there's no uh, usability associated with them. And this one, I guess you'd kind of expect to be this way because they're selling slide rules. Um, this one I like because um, here's this guy, he wants you to do business with him, but he wants you to change your browser size in order to interact with his site. And he even tells you that this, it's, this uh, my site's best viewed in 1024 by 768. Yours is set to 1680 by 1050. Can you change it for me so that we can have a good experience here? Um, <laughs> What's this? I still don't even know what this site's for. This is uh, for tourism. But you guys get the point, right? So, so developers develop stuff 
that meet a set of requirements, but nobody's really going to use that, or it's kind of pretty much a, a, wa a waste of time. So traditional UX, you might say, okay, well, really what we need is a human factors engineer, or a, a usability guy, somebody to come in and, and think about these things a little bit more. And what they're concerned about is um, navigation and system flow and page layout, uh, things that do cross over into the visual world uh, a little bit, but this is much more from a uh, cognitive psychology or a, uh, an engineering perspective. Um, and they might come up with something like this. Now, it's usable. You can look at it and say, oh, I know where my speed skates are. But the visual aesthetics on it are kind of, I don't know. To me, it was just kind of, maybe it works. Stacy was contending that it actually does work because they're supposed to be cheap skates. And it looks like a cheap site, so maybe you buy into it. Yeah, it was on brand equity. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. Like I said, maybe it works, but but clearly the UX person wasn't uh, wasn't involving to me. It wasn't involving a visual person. Um, and then business concerns, right? So they're concerned about cost and schedule and promoting a brand. Um, and I highlight pro promoting a brand because. This site clearly promotes a brand. However, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. Right? So, um, so the usability on this falls down also. Okay, so from a siloing perspective, this is a, um, uh, a the, this top left is a system that I uh, replaced a number of years ago. Um, that was developed by uh, a developer who was working by himself. And um, you can't really tell on here, but this was an old VB6 app. And in the upper right corner where the X would be, it usually you'd close out the app, uh, he had disabled that for some reason. So you can't, can't close the app in the normal way. You have to hit your end program button down here in the bottom. Um, this is a site, or this was a system to help people who were uh, recording scores of uh, like uh, the drum and, and flag uh, competitions. And so they're asking these people who are probably just moms and dads of, of band, um, kids in band, to enter a database, a path to a database to be able to update that. And uh, just things like that where the UI on it just was terrible. So we came in and looked at it, and we rebuilt something that didn't have any of those aspects on it. But I personally did the visual aesthetics on this bottom one. So clearly, you don't want to hire me to do that, <laughs> right? But uh, we did do uh, UX, and, and it was well-written code. We used TDD and all of the refactoring mercilessly and all of those types of practices. So while this one had UX and good dev behind it, it still falls down because we didn't involve the, the visual folks, right? Um, and then this, uh, this other example here on the right, um, I, that was a project that I was working on and did a lot of the usability for, but I was throwing it over the wall into a, a group of developers who decided to ignore what I was suggesting and just took it as suggestions. And so within about three months, they ended up with something like it's in the upper right corner there um, then the company got me back involved, it kicked out the one guy who was kind of leading all of this, and after a few months we ended up with what's down here. So, so even, if, even if you try to incorporate one aspect of this, if you're not all working together, you still end up with stuff that you don't really want. Okay, before we do this exercise, are there any comments or questions? I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but any other uh, comments or thoughts that come to mind? Okay, what I want you to do, and this is kind of a building exercise that we'll do throughout the whole workshop, is I want you to think uh, for a minute, maybe write some ideas down. Um, and again, that we're going to be building on this, so you probably will want to write some, some of your thoughts down. Um, on your own, think about a new digital storage system. The system should store and organize any type of file, 
uh, and make it easy to find the file. So, and then, okay. S so stop there at file <laughs> for right now. As the, pr as the thing goes up, you'll be able to see what the next line is. Um, so what I want you to do, so often a difficult problem that we have <clears throat> is just simply maintaining our files on, a, on our computers, right? So we create these elaborate um, folder structures to store files in, uh, but even then we still don't necessarily know wh where to find things or we end up having to do some kind of search mechanism or most of the time it's a browse from what I see of people where they're browsing down through their, their list of folders. So it seems like there's a better way of doing this, okay? I'd like to, I'd like to know that this is the PDF that Bruce sent me last week. I'd like to know that it was not only related to the, this project over here, but it had some comments about uh, the way he implemented some piece of JavaScript. And so two weeks from now, when I'm thinking about the JavaScript, I may think, oh, Bruce sent me something about JavaScript, and I can find it that way. Or four weeks from now, I want to be able to think, I got something from Bruce a couple of weeks ago about this project. Right, so I don't, the, the mental map here doesn't go to my folder structure, or I have to remember which one I stored it under, the JavaScript folder or the project name folder. So I, I want to <coughs> blow up that whole structure, okay? I want to be able to search, find what I'm looking for in a very uh, fluid way, based on whatever I'm thinking at the time, I want to store it, but then four weeks from now I might be thinking something completely different, and now I want to find it. Okay, so just think and make a few notes to yourself uh, as to how this new file system might would, might would work. <clears throat> okay, so now um, discuss what some of your ideas were with those people around you, just your neighbor or, um, again, <clears throat> uh, in a workshop, I was kind of expecting guys to interact with me and with each other, so I know developers often like to text each other or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> however you want to interact, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> but uh, just <laughs> um, kind of talk through what, what some of the ideas were that you had. Okay, this is, uh, hopefully you kind of had a little bit of an idea of what maybe what other folks have, have come up with. Um, there we go. So is anybody willing to say how they felt when they were working by themselves? It's a big problem by yourself, okay. Isolated? Okay, okay, good. Where do you start? Yeah, like not, uh, you know, worrying that, oh, why am I thinking about this the wrong way? I mean, sort of so lack of confidence? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, is there a better way? Like, I, 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 my, is my mind going down the wrong path? <laughs> okay. <laughs> thinking about the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I, like when I go straight to, it's like technical solutions that I know of as a job, right? So labels and tags and, right. and siblings and stuff like that. Right. But then my mom would get it. Right, exactly. Yep. Then I was about to say that, and if you didn't, <laughs> right? Just solving the problem for myself. Right. Yes. Yeah. Solve the problem for myself. Yeah. That's good. Any others? You know, one thing about this question is, even though it's so simple, when Rob and I were talking about this, it's really profound with the word "feel." When we think about work, we don't think about how we feel very much. But with all the research they're doing in neuroscience, and if you've read the book Drive with studies on motivation, a lot about your emotional state impacts how your brain works and directly affects your ability to engage the regions of your brain capable of creative solutions. So if you're working in a process or an environment to where you feel a lack of confidence, you feel unprepared to take on the task, you feel a little nervous and hesitant, you're not gonna do creative work. Your brain just physically isn't capable of doing that. So this is a really profound example to take a step back and to think about those things because if you wanna come up with a creative solution, you need to 
let your brain, your mind work, somebody mentioned the word mind, um, to allow you to find and discover those solutions that are out there. So, but that's a whole nother talk, but just another thing that we had as a side conversation yep. that we wanted to people think about too. Yeah, good. Okay, so then what did you discover by working with others? Other perspectives? Other perspectives? There was a, uh, almost like a feeding frenzy. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that too. Or, yeah, and what about this? And there was a lot of similar ideas that were quickly reinforced and expanded on. Okay. So you became more confident in what you're doing as a group. Others? I think you could, you could argue the opposite too. You feel less confident because you get different points of view and when you work on problems, sometimes you try to simplify it and maybe it's not as simple as one direction. Okay, sure. Well, and that actually, it gets to some of the, which is again, yet another talk, um, which is the whole idea of, of just personal interaction, right? That as soon as someone voices something, they feel like they own it. And so then if, if it is kind of a crazy idea, but you're in this brainstorming feeding frenzy, you want to back away from that idea, but you might be embarrassed and other things. So, so working in a group can cause some of these other problems as well. Um, and so having this collaborative team where we're all working together and there's a lot of mutual respect there's um, a freedom to fail, a freedom to say something stupid. Uh, all of those things become very important while, when you're working with, with other people as well. So somebody else? Um, there's more ideas generated because uh, my thought, either thought than the other uh, or person, and there's just more of a lot of growth of, uh, growth of, uh, of ideas. Of yeah, good. Any others? Okay. Um, well, so in this in this world that we we live in, uh, we're we're interacting with the user interface almost constantly, right? We we uh, read a book on our Kindle or iPad before we go to bed at night, and we set it there uh, on the nightstand, and then when we get up in the morning. We check the weather, maybe even before we get out of bed, uh, to see what to wear that day. So um, we're interacting with uh, the face constantly. And so it becomes more and more important. For, for developers, we're, we're so accustomed to how things work, we kind of intuit uh, how certain things work, whether they're usable or not. And so to the point earlier, uh, can your, can your mom actually use this? Or can your three-year-old actually use this? Um, the, uh, that's, that's really what pushes these apps uh, and the sites and the things that we're trying to build uh, into, into true public use is that they are more usable. And it's becoming more and more prevalent. And so it becomes more and more important to all of us to do things, build things that have a good user interface. And the user interfaces are only going to continue to change. This is a tangible interface. I don't know if you guys have messed around with the Microsoft Surface. Um, but uh, these little blocks actually interact with the table. And the table interacts with the blocks. And, and um, there's more and more de physical devices that are going to interact more and more with other things. So this is even more beyond a gesture interface. This is a um, uh, again, with now, now you think of the, all the problems that we have. Now you pull electrical engineers and industrial designers into the group, right? And you've got even a larger team of people who are trying to interact and build stuff like this. Um, you know, this is, this is in a lab at MIT right now uh, where you can dial your phone just because there's a light that's projecting from a source on your chest. Um, and then, of course, we all know this is in the future, but... Uh, it's not probably not as far away as we'd like to think. So these things become very, uh, very important. And we need to pull in all four of these disciplines to make sure that we get, uh, we get, get it right. Well, that minority report, why is actually functional? They actually use the working system. 
Yeah, I've, I've seen the, there's a, a, um, a guy who does a demo of it uh, in, in the lab, uh, but it's not necessary. So like the Microsoft Surface, the first one that I showed you with the baby, um, three years ago that one of those tables was 20K, last year it was 12K, this year they're down to 8K. So it's pretty easy to imagine that within the next five years, you guys are gonna buy one for your kids and you're gonna play air hockey on a, on, a, on a table like that. Another layer to consider is the dark side of that UI example. Because um, if you talk to developmental specialists, it's not appropriate for anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, well that's actually an interesting uh, comment too because I heard um, something just yesterday uh, where one of the guys said, um, how did he put it? My three-year-old just started playing video games, which is about a year and a half after he should have started. And I thought, what? You know, that's, go ahead. Right. Yep. So yeah. Consideration. No, it is. You're 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 very you're very true. Um, and that's uh, I, you know, just as a side note, without getting too far off the topic, um, I keep my kids limited time on those things too. And that's why I was so surprised when this guy said this because um, it's the it's the playing with the rocks and sticks and the you know hitting each other and <laughs> things that boys do and are supposed to do. Um, doing flips on a trampoline and all that, that's, that's where you develop these other skills. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, playing the Wii, while it's a lot of fun, it doesn't necessarily you know, teach them what they need to be learning. Well, it, it, no matter what, kind of going back to the examples you had in the beginning, especially with Ford, the time it took with his invention of the Model T and the mass production and more and more people buying those to where we had the infrastructure on the highway in place, that time continuum has just collapsed upon itself. You know, we're all reading about and experiencing how there's exponential rates of change and that the timeline is just accelerating more and more and more. So with those factors, we really don't get the luxury to work in siloed spaces anymore because things are changing too fast outside of our silo. And how in the world could any of us be a subject matter expertise in any one area with all these changes? We have to rely on each other and the knowledge that you have and you have and I have so that we can then create something that'll relate with that fast paced market and economy and factors that are out there. So. You know, that's why it's not really a new team we're talking about today, but it's really the way that we need to move moving forward of these perspectives, these professionals, these highly skilled, talented people working together to solve these quickly mm -hmm. <laughs> and complex mm -hmm. uh, challenges that we're all facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Sure. You think that, you know, you're talking about face time and that kind of... Sure. Um, time to face is what I said, but... Time to face, yeah. Yep. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, do you think that that has an influence? On, I kind of sometimes think that has an influence on, you know, all these big, clunky, mainframing type apps <coughs> that they live with them, you know, a lot of the big companies and stuff a lot to work with. You know, do you think that their users, because they get so used to nice things like the like before, you know, uh, Pinterest, and Instagram and stuff, and then they come to work and it's like, right. are they... Yeah, so I, we're seeing that, yeah. definitely. Um, the, the folks who are pulling in user experience, you know, they, <laughs> they understand development and they understand graphics, but they, they're seeing that there's a gap there, folks wanting to pull in this user experience design, understanding of who the person is and what they're up to. Um, is definitely growing. There's a pretty large demand for that. And I would say you have that consumerism factor that's making sort of the enterprise wake up and say, you know, hey, when I'm at home, this is really cool, but for some reason when I come to work, it's not so cool. 
And so they question it, but where I think the pain in the pocket is for why they're investing in it now is the next workforce. So the kids who are in college now, their leaders, their employees who are coming tomorrow, they're gonna show up at work and go, what in the world is this? I can't work with this, because it's not what they know. They've grown up with Google, they've grown up with Facebook, they've grown up with the iPhone and the iPad. And so the businesses that we're working with, granted they want the productivity gains and the employee experience today, but they're really scared about what's coming tomorrow and they won't be prepared when it comes time to compete for those workers that you know we're all competing for now but the ones coming five years from now are going to expect a very different experience and and they will not tolerate that mainframe gronky experience right <laughs> but you're right uh, and um, they can still at least for the moment continue to push out that there isn't a, a significant competition. Uh, if someone invested $12 million five years ago for a new ERP system, it's unlikely that they're ready to take that bite now. Um, but I think, as Stacy said, as we go forward over the next few years, you'll begin to see where that, that competition will. The, 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 the startup who wants to compete in that space, who has a nicer UI, will begin to win out. Especially if they put a team like this together. <laughs> yes. Yep. You, you can see that already, though, right? Things like five years ago, all of the salespeople in the entire world carried a BlackBerry. Right. Yeah. And the enterprise said, here's your BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. And they said, thank you. And then over the course of five years, they're all saying no thank you. Mm -hmm. We don't want this. I would rather buy my own iPhones and use your stupid blackberry. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and the same thing with iPads. Salespeople don't want laptops anymore, and they want. We need this app to work on the on, on the iPad, and if it doesn't, we don't want it. Right. And, and there's this rejection that's happening today, and that's that's it, it's we see it as a small consulting shop with P and G. Mm -hmm. They have a small team sitting somewhere that says, we've got this spreadsheet and we would like it to be awesome. And they come to us because we can build it faster than their own IT team can, right? And we can do this kind of integrated team development approach, and they love that, and they're going outside of their own purchasing channels to make that happen. Right. That, that's gonna, you know, that's, I think that's just gonna get more and more and more because teams can do this kind of stuff on their own without having to go through the big IT organization to get Oracle or SAP or whatever. Right. It, well, and if, C and if CIOs haven't been in these meetings already, I know especially this year, the BYOD is huge. They have to figure out their policies for bring your own device. And so that was something they were just smirking at two years ago, like, oh, we'll never allow this. And now they're trying to figure it out. So it, I, I think the, the workers and the staff, especially the knowledge workers, have the impact to drive business in this area to, to solve it and address it. Right, right. They're like, we need it on the iPad. They're like, why? Well, because it would just be cool. And it's like, are people going to buy a forklift maintenance contract with this? If sliders and tools. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Well, and to that point, um, some of the folks that we're interacting with who are asking for these types of apps, there's a, uh, a workshop this afternoon, I think, on responsive design. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but. Um, that's really what that's really what we're pushing more than the actual app, because then you can build it on whatever, and as long as it can be a web app, it can live, you know, on any device. You don't have to custom build those things. So to that guy's point, if you build a responsive web app, you can have your crane contract on there, but you didn't have to build an iPad app to do it. And then when you do bring your own device, it works. You don't, you know, everything works. So.
Right. Seriously? Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Right. And that's a, but that's a layer that folks who have come up, again, to Stacy's point earlier, the c people who have come up through that using texting for the last five years to interact. I mean, that's what my kids do in the car. They text each other as we're... Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate. To, to you and I, we would say, well, that's not a very high bandwidth form of communication, right? But, but uh, I like two people on a whiteboard, personally. That's the highest bandwidth. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's good. Um, oops, wrong way. So I want to... Kind of, you, you guys are getting it. I want to kind of pull in an example from, from a completely different uh, world uh, of mountain bikes. Back in the 60s, well, actually, mountain biking itself started back, like, in Europe with dudes on regular bicycle mountains. Um, but bikes uh, specifically built for that didn't really start to, to take on until in, into the 70s. And the, so Trek, uh, bicycle decided that they wanted to get into that market. And they came up with a, with a mountain bike that worked. Wider tires, the shock on the front, um, the seat kind of back, the different types of handlebars. And people bought these, but the, the user, so it looks nice, it sold well, it was engineered well, but the user experience on it fell down. And the reason it fell down is because there was no shock in the rear, like on a motorcycle. And so they went back and they got the engineers involved and they came up with a solution, but nobody's really going to buy a solution that an engineer comes up with. Okay, again, I was a developer for a long time. I understand that. <laughs> speaking, to, speaking to my own, uh, people don't like what, what we come up with on our own. So they pulled in an industrial designer and they came up with just a different way of doing the same thing. This, so now this shot is looks nice and works well and is engineered well, but even this shot isn't what anyone buys. The business, business hasn't gotten involved yet. This is what people buy, right? You don't even see the bike. You just see an experience. And that's really what we're trying to talk about here is, de is delivering a complete experience for our users and our customers. And it takes all four of those circles uh, visual, UX, and uh, dev, and business to bring this together. So again, I'm not going to spend uh, any time really at all defining or talking through uh, the visual aesthetic side or the, the developer side. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, UX. Um, this is my main focus now over the last few years. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to, to talk through some of these things and, and have you guys work through some examples uh, just to get a feel for what the value of this, uh, this discipline brings. When I talk about user experience, um, I'm, I'm talking about understanding who the user is, what their goals are, what their tasks are, and making sure that, this, that the UI itself supports those things. Um, again, one of my early examples was the Xerox site uh, that was nicely, that looked nice, and at first glance you wouldn't think that there was anything wrong with it. But once you began to interact with it, the user experience on it was terrible because of the, when, when you brought a task to it, um, it didn't support that task at all. Or when you were thinking about something, it didn't support that at all. So we need to bring this user experience, um, I hate to use the word design, but this user experience uh, focus uh, into these projects. This is a video that I um, put together. Uh, it's actually a snapshot of a video uh, to illustrate getting into um, a situation and understanding from a user's perspective what the user's up to. Um, it's actually a six minute video. The reason that it looks like this right here is because I kind of spliced it and cut it down to two minutes. But hopefully you can kind of see a little bit of the pains that I was going through in this experience and begin to understand how I could take this into, um, into uh, design.
best way to know your users is to immerse yourself in that environment. For this part of the project, what I've done is I went and spent a day as a wheelchair user discovering some of the difficulties that a person with a mobility impairment has getting around. My toothbrushes are all the way at the top, so I know I can't reach that. The chair itself wouldn't even fit in the bathroom. If I had to use the chair all the time, something that like something would have to change. We would have to expand the doorway. After I got dressed and, and whatnot, I was able to wheel out into the hallway there, but then I had to go down the steps. Um, my office is in the basement. Can you, how many down these steps? Or many? Can I guess? We decided to go to Dairy Queen just to kind of see, you know, what it would be like. And I don't think the person inside even noticed me at first. Can you get up there? So, no. I think I'll just... It wouldn't be very easy to get up there. Yeah, I don't know how I would. I'd just sit here. You know, it's not the, the end of the world by any means. Those kinds of things we, over and over again throughout your day would become extremely frustrating. Another lesson learned from an engineer's perspective is that you don't really know your users if you just talk with them or if you just observe. Now, I'm no expert, of course, after using a wheelchair for a day to get around, but it would clearly affect my perspective on how technology would be designed. And I think anyone who is thinking about designing technology uh, for the disabled community in any way, any assistive technology, should try to immerse themselves in the environment for a short period of time anyway, just to try to understand what are the barriers and actually experience the barriers themselves rather than just make observations. Okay, so part of what we're trying to do is understand uh, the user truly from the user's perspective. And uh, go ahead. And the language we use is important when it comes out meaning with the label of the disability impairment rather than difference. I work with an awful lot of developers and the users have an impairment so that if they just learn how to use the system then they would be a lot of Right, right. Yeah, that's good. The um, uh, one site that I, a buddy of mine pulled me into recently, uh, again, was developed by a marketing agency. It was uh, graphically oriented, um, but it's for a prosthetics company. And uh, the targets were small. The, uh, so you're trying to, to move a mouse with something that would be equivalent of working a mouse with your elbow. and. Uh, trying to line that up on a small target. You know, clearly somebody was not thinking about who the audience was on a site for prosthetists. Um, so yeah, it's exactly the point, thinking through some of those things. Any other comments? So again, from a, a user experience perspective, what we're trying to do is understand this is more than just uh, imagining or I guess or if I was them I think I would do this this is truly understanding from the user's perspective what they are thinking and um, being able to characterize that in some way uh, one tool that we use uh, and you may have heard this term before is the uh, persona uh, this was developed by Alan Cooper who's the guy who actually was the first author of Visual Basic way back in the day um, and he has a, a 
a company now called Cooper Design out in San Francisco. Um, but he developed this idea of personas and it's taken off. You can read uh, whole books on this topic. But basically what we're trying to do is characterize who this user is. So um, these are two different templates that I've used. Um, in this bottom one, we're trying to understand the key characteristics of the user, the user's goals, influencers, and pain points. Uh, what kind of questions is the user bringing to the table? So often what I'll, when you think of tasks, what I'll do is I'll think about five or six tasks that I would want to do on a site if I'm coming to the site. Uh, it doesn't take much to, to come up with these, right? If I, uh, one of the, like for this place, one of the first things I wanted to do was find the address. And so I went to the, went to the site and hunted around for the address. How hard or easy is it to find the address for a museum, a place where people are going to want to physically go? Um, things like that where you're beginning to think about how is a person what are the questions that they're bringing to this? Uh, then this other one is similar, um, but just some of the uh, comments and, and uh, whatnot. The, this uh, grid on the left here uh, is when we're thinking about more of a, a total system uh, from different roles, perspectives, and what kind of, if it's a salesperson out on the road, uh, what kind of experience are they bringing versus uh, the person behind the counter versus the person who's administrating items in a warehouse? Um, you know, they're all bringing a different perspective, a different set of skills and to, to the system. So, uh, so again, what are some of the things that we can do? Are, are, is uh, interviews, focus groups? I'm really down on focus groups. I think I've only done a couple. I really, I really recommend that you don't do focus groups, mostly because uh, my experience anyway is one or two stronger personalities dominate everyone else, and everyone else just gets tired of listening to those one or two people talk, and so they just want to leave. <laughs> so it's better to have a one-on-one -on -one interview. Uh, best would be to, if you're going to do an interview, to like be in their environment, physically go to their office or where they work in their cube. Um, So the exercise we did was like to work on something right by ourselves. Yep. Together, yep. Those well, it does, but what we didn't have was a user, right? I mean, we're all users of this system that we're we're considering, um, but in 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 a different environment. If I'm working on a call center app, I need to go and sit in that call center and understand what that person's really doing. It's hard for me. I've sat in lots of call centers, but I still go into a new. A, I know, but you're saying Whenever oh, people start I see. Interacting, um, you still have consensus seeking and strong personalities. Sure. The, the, the main difference seems to be um, that it's a, it's a one hour period of time in which people are being asked to give their opinions on something that they may or may not be interacting with rather than uh, true collaborative problem solving. And so often a focus group will be something like, um, uh, what, what are the top three things that um, bother you about your current si system or something like that? And so the one person might go on for 20 minutes about the three things that bother them. And those three things may bother them just because of the way they've got their system configured. And so the other three people sitting in the room are thinking, well, that's not a problem for me at all. But yet this stronger personality kind of dominated that time. So it's that type of thing that I'm trying to avoid with the focus groups. Right. I, I, the, the idea of a focus group to me has been uh, presented as a way of getting a lot of input quickly. And I guess what I may be saying is that the value of that input is much lower than the value of some of the other inputs. I would, I would value interviewing five people for 20 minutes or sitting in their, their cube with them uh, more than I would having five people in a room with me for an hour and a half. I think you get the data more raw. <coughs> uh oh, I lost my internet connection.
Where was I? So did that answer your question? I don't know if, if I did or not. Um, Relate to the, this, how do you get management or other team members or mindsets to change uh, when you get from a maybe extreme perspective of talking to users and this kind of stuff with four ways of time? Well, uh, two responses to that. Um, one is uh, for the people, I've stopped trying to sell UX. Uh, just like a number of years ago, I worked with Agile teams and would sell Agile ways of doing things, and I stopped trying to sell Agile at that time also. Um, people either get it or they don't. And so most of the time, we're being pulled into something because they identify the fact that, hey, this user experience isn't working for us. Or uh, I have a client right now who came to me in January and he said, um, you know, when I show up at uh, an Apple store, it's a great experience. When I go out to their site, it's a great experience. When I call into their call center, it's a great experience. When I interact with their devices, it's a great experience. That's what I want for my company. Uh, so he gets it. So I'm not selling it to him at that point in time. The other side of that question, though, is that there are people who, now that management may have brought us in, there are people who still poo-poo the idea. And I actually have a good example here near the end of this. Um, but I, uh, I have had people who are strongly opinionated about one thing or another. Oftentimes it's developers, um, and the, even the example that I have here at the end, it's a, um, a checkout experience. And um, they're wanting a one-page checkout experience, and to them, Newegg is the way to go with checkout experiences. And so that's really, this is what they're pushing. And I'm thinking, but this is, a consumer site. This isn't for technologists. This is for, for you know, my mom's not going to do this. There's a reason that Amazon has a four-step checkout experience. But rather than argue with them, I mocked up uh, word for word, icon for icon, the new egg checkout experience, all three pages of it. And then I mocked up icon for icon, the Amazon experience, all five pages of it. And I sat down and just got five I don't remember, five or seven users in a room, but the people who were disagreeing with me, I, told, I invited them into it also. I said, you guys sit back here, don't say anything, just watch. We bring these people in. I literally had, in that session, I literally had one person who had never bought anything online. And I was thinking, wow, don't do it. I want to use you forever. <laughs> because that, that person's like really rare. <laughs> um, so, so, but as I, as I went through it with, and she was like uh, participant number two, at the end of just seeing how she interacted, and these are just black and white wireframes, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, just watching her interact with just these pieces of paper and a black and white wireframe, they both just got up and left. They knew that, that the new egg experience was not going to work. She stumbled so hard on it. Go ahead. One of the other talks that's gonna be here tomorrow Mm -hmm. yep. Anybody who says, I think we'll get higher conversion if we do this, mm -hmm. the answer is, okay, show me. Yep. Yep. And everything is a numbers game. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very easy to make decisions. are easy. Yep. I want to try this. Okay, try it and measure the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And that's, I was going to say that. I use the A-B test and I use the 30-second test all the time. So I'll just uh, go. Uh, the A-B test is, is show it two ways. And... Uh, you have to counterbalance it, so you show sample one to five people first, followed by sample two, and then you show sample two to five people first, followed by sample one. Um, but it doesn't take many people that you show this to and ask them, which w w ask them the task that you're wanting them to do. If you were to check out right now, which, where would you click? Or if you were to find an address right now, where would you click? And, and just target it to that task, it takes two minutes. You can just walk through a, a a cafeteria at some place at work or wherever and just ask random people um, and it doesn't it, it takes longer to explain to them what you're doing and why than it does for them to do the test. Uh, 
The other test that I like to use is kind of what I was doing there with um, some of those sites where I said, what is, quickly, what's this one about? Um, what you'll do is you hold that up to somebody for even 10 seconds and then take it away and say, what was that site about? And they'll, they'll tell you pretty, pretty straight way. I was working with a company just recently where they had a report that they're sending out to their consumers and, or their customers and it had a whole bunch of rows of data and stuff and a little tiny summary at the top. And I said to him, uh, this, the guy who's in charge of sales, I said, you need to rework this because nobody's seeing these numbers at the top that you're summarizing. And he's like, how do you know? And I, I, I did it with him. And he's, he's like, oh. So then he went back and just even simply on the report had him put a red circle graphic around uh, the numbers that he wanted to pay attention to. And sure enough, your eyes go right there. So it's just simple things like that that can, that can enhance the user experience in a great way. Um, so direct observation is another uh, handy way of, of uh, doing things. And what I'll do, again, is like in a call center setting or really anywhere that I'm trying to understand what folks are up to, I'll just sit with them for uh, 20 minutes and make notes. Um, you can get a lot. And often what I'll do, because I, I, I'm just getting so much, is I'll go back. I'll just do it in 20 minute segments. So I might on Monday do 20 minutes with somebody and then on Wednesday we do 20 minutes with somebody just to get uh, be able to go back and summarize notes and things, make uh, different observations. It doesn't have to take a long time, but once you see what people are up to, uh, it'll, it'll guide. Um, immersion, that's what the whole video was about, was immersing yourself into that setting. Uh, you know, if you actually went into a call center and answered phone calls um, for one phone call, you'd probably totally change the UI that, that, they're, that they're working with. Um, and then workflow analysis, this is just the larger thing that most of us would know and understand is really what's the overall task? What are we up to and what are the steps in that process? Okay, so as an exercise, wow. We're not gonna take long to do these exercises because it's almost 11 o'clock. I didn't realize that this was gonna go. I've got a whole lot more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours I was, I was thinking that this was gonna go a little uh, faster, I guess. Um, so. In this exercise, just interview each other and determine what the goals would be of that person. So uh, you guys have already talked a little bit about what you would want, but that requirements are different than the goal. What's the goal of doing this? Why, why, are you build, why am I wanting to use this system? That's the question that you want to discover from interviewing someone. So one of you be the user, one of you be the interviewee, or if you're in a group of three, um, Maybe you have two interviewees and one interviewer, or however you guys want to do it, but just kind of get, the, get a feel a little bit of how this might would go. Um, a fellow that I saw who once on, on teaching, he was giving a lecture on teaching, he said, most teachers cover the material, and uh, that always stood out in my head, so I don't want to I don't want to cover just cover material. I want to kind of give you at least an opportunity to interact and see some of this. Um, but we do only have a half hour. So I want to get, get through. Um, what kind of things did you guys discover just from that brief time uh, of interviewing? So you're asking about goals. What was different about this than when you were just collaborating, talking about requirements and, and stuff? Just, you know, sometimes your users know far less than you would expect they would know. OK, yeah, good. They don't have a basic glossary now. Right, right. Yeah, that's good. It's hard to communicate your goals specifically, what you're looking for. Yes. Maybe I don't even know what I'm looking for. Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, and Steve Jobs used to call that out, right? He would say, I can't, I don't build what people want. Which I get that, ask that question all the time. What do you think of Steve Jobs saying that? Well, he didn't, he built what they wanted. He just didn't ask them what they wanted, right? If they, they would have told him what he wanted, they just wanted a smaller, lighter laptop, not an iPad. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. But the identif So you guys were able to identify a goal more quickly. Yeah. Who's discussing the importance of empathy? You know, forcing yourself to be empathetic to the situation. 
situation in which someone's going to be using whatever this tool is that you're building, trying to put yourself in that in their shoes. Mm -hmm. It answers so many questions. If right. you do that, they don't have to. They don't have to verbalize what the goal is. If they can explain to you how they're going to use what you're trying to do. There. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And oftentimes, users will talk in terms of UI components, right? They'll say, well, I want to drop down here, I want to check box here, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'll write all that down, or I'll pay attention to it, but I try really hard not to use check boxes, right? <laughs> so that might be the word that they use to indicate something that they're checking off in a list, but there's probably other better ways of doing it. So to your point, you kind of have to interpret what they're saying into what they really want. <coughs> I think Doug might have said this like last week, but uh, the hardest part of the developer's job is to get the user to describe the problem and not the perceived solution. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, this is my own little invention. This is something that you guys might uh, find helpful. Um, I call it a do go map. Um, it's very simple. On each of these cards, which aren't very clear up here, unfortunately, um, but each of these less or more white hazy spots are actually uh, 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 five by five note cards. And on those note cards, I'm writing uh, ge maybe uh, general or even a couple of times specific uh, types of parameters that might be on an any given screen, like if they're entering a username or a password or something like that, I might write that at the top. But then in the middle of the card, what I'm writing is what can you do on this screen? What's the goal of this screen? Not how do you do it, not where are things located, just what's the purpose of the screen? What can I do here? I can view a list of uh, catalog items. I can um, log in, I can whatever, I can purchase something from this screen. Um, and then the bottom I write where you can go from this screen, so hence the word do go. Um, I write what I can do on a screen and where I can go from a screen. Basically what it is is a, is a merging of uh, the old sitemap hierarchy. So at, in a t traditional sitemap you have home page at the top and then the hierarchically down. What this is doing is showing all of the different interactions within the, within the system. So I actually put the home page in the middle um, so on this one, this might be the home page, and then working out from there because I want to see all of the different interactions. And often, where does a user want to go when you ask that question? It uh, gets answered by other places within the system, which if you were building it hierarchically, you would have never drawn those lines. And so what we're trying to do is, is see all of the different interactions within this truly web-based approach of an app. Right, um, so this is something that I find uh, really handy, um, and I've used it on a number of things. I was with a client recently where I was walking through this with them, uh, and he says, "You know, I really like this analog way that you do things," which I just thought was kind of funny because I, these are all handwritten, right? It's just me, but it's it's me writing on these cards. But it's again, it's collaborative. We're standing at a whiteboard talking, uh, working through stuff. Now, what what you can do then is identify a couple of user scenarios that might be common for a person interacting with the, um, with the site. And you can run those scenarios through this. We haven't drawn a wireframe. We haven't written a line of code yet. We've just simply thought about how does the person going to interact with this system. And we're able to um, uh, run a flow through here. If they come to the home page and they want to buy something, uh, they, they type this, and then they hit that, and then they see this detail page, and then they work their way through a checkout. Um, I can see how quickly can I get a user through that's, that scenario. How many clicks does it take? All of those kinds of things that are traditionally in a flowchart are also on here. So it's blending a sitemap with a flowchart all into one place. Okay, I'm going to skip this exercise, um, but what, what we were talking about is information architecture. Um, and there's books and 
websites and journals and all kinds of stuff out there available on information architecture in general. But the, the general things that we're talking about is task analysis, flowchart site maps, and, and the Dougal map. So using what you discovered about the user's goals, determine the tasks that would be required to accomplish that goal. So in the first step, we were asking, what is your goal? Now we're asking, what are the tasks that it would take to accomplish that goal? And so maybe in the user's mind in this application that we were talking about, all they want to do is be able to drag and drop something from uh, their desktop into your file storage system. Or they want to download something off the web directly into your file storage system. Uh, so those might be two tasks that would be involved with serving the goal of, of this system that we're building. Okay, um, paper prototyping is something that's been around for quite a while. Again, there's whole, whole books that are written on this. Um, this is, I, I use um, Balsamic to draw these. For uh, the Mac users, there's um, a template in Keynote and a few other tools that are out there available to do wireframing. Uh, this one's just Balsamic. Um, but basically, again, what I'm doing is just drawing a black and white. There's no colors. Um, what we're able to test here then is uh, the, the location, the labels of things, can people s find and see what they're looking for uh, quickly. Uh, so these are two dashboards for uh, the two different views of the same system. Uh, so this was for a call center and this one was for somebody who's um, uh, more of an admin type of person. Uh, so we've got two different views of uh, within, uh, within the roles of the same system. Um, but what I could do is run one of those scenarios that I ran my Dugo map through, I can run that same scenario now with, you, with real users. So I can go into a call center, take 15 minutes, print out a pile of those uh, paper prototypes, and ask, sit down and show, put it in front of them and say, okay, someone just called and they want to know something about their banking information, where do you click? And in this, they could either they would see that they could either change something here just within this card itself regarding banking information or there is a banking tab up there. Um, so I could see, do they go straight to the card or do they go straight to the label at the top? Um, and, and with just even seven users, you can begin to get a feel of, is this laid out well? Do people understand what you're trying to do? It doesn't have to take a lot of time just an hour and a half or so with seven users, and you got a real nice uh, set of feedback for, from people. Um, extensive usability studies, you know, there's, there's um, uh, whole companies that do uh, the two-way window thing and all of that. Um, while we're trying to collaborate, and while we're trying to work with teams, this just gets you a long way <laughs> down the path um, toward those same kinds of things. Uh, the, I think there's a diminishing return after you get past this, especially in a highly collaborative environment that we're trying to uh, promote. So now you can get the visual folks involved and you see the same two wireframes at the top, but now we apply some color to them, some styling, and you can really see how this is starting to pop and, and pull together and the users can find things uh, even easier once we identify um, what, you know, how to, to wrap it up and present it. Okay, so again, um, in prototyping we uh, do sketches and wireframes. Uh, you, we, we will do um, highly interactive types of prototyping like with HTML or uh, whatever, but you guys are probably more familiar with that kind of thing, so I didn't want to call that out. Um, one rule of thumb that I use as I'm sitting down to uh, design a uh, site or a, a page even or even a component is I'll often tr try to force myself to have the discipline to draw it two or three times in two or three different ways because most of the time the first way that I draw it sucks but we would <coughs> just tend to go with that first way because maybe it's the more obvious or more intuitive or more um, yeah just more obvious way of doing it so by forcing myself into that second and third try uh, just even if they're kind of crazy ideas, often it's those little nuggets that make things really more usable that come out in that second and third time. So in this exercise, what I was going to have you do is sketch uh, out a screen or two to support the tasks.
This uh, is a usability test that I'm going to play for you. Um, about halfway through, it's, it's going to be quiet at first, about halfway through, you're going to hear me laugh. And you have to understand that I'm not laughing at the user, okay? We would have been sitting in there with her interacting with this site where she's trying to buy something for probably 20 minutes by the time you hear me laugh. So we have a rapport. She's frustrated. I'm trying to make it a little lighter for her, okay? So don't think that I'm laughing at her because I'm really not. Is it just tired of me? <laughs> oh, I love that. Nine, eight, seven, right? Twelve, ten. Yeah, all of that's right. So you're sitting at home by yourself, what are you going to do now? Log off. Okay, so the problem was that she had an error up above off of her screen that she couldn't see the error. But what's the point of this site? The point of the site is to sell her something. She's been on your site, she's found their favorite widget that she's wanting to buy. She's all the way to the page where she's ready to type in her credit card number and give you money and you won't take it, okay? So that's clearly a problem. Um, and that's what usability studies and things can identify is, is uh, uh, where those issues are. And so again, sitting down with the user, walking them through scenarios, giving them tasks, uh, recording that stuff, making observations, you can uh, discover a lot. And it, again, it doesn't take, oops, oh yeah, it doesn't take a lot uh, to discover those things. So. Um, again, in a highly collaborative environment where you're maybe in an agile world where you're working on three-week sprints and you don't have a lot of time to do this kind of thing, um, you can test it out with three to six users. Just get some feedback uh, and, and keep moving. Introduce new stories to accommodate for those things and just keep, keep moving through. The, um, the out of, uh, what I suggest is larger studies that you would do maybe with 20 users, you'd probably do out of sprint activities. So you might line up, uh, keep your de developers going for three weeks, and then during that same three week period of time, maybe set up a larger test and, and run a larger test with, with more people to get other feedback. Okay, this is uh, some work that we did with the National Science Foundation um, for, this is a, a reader uh, for the blind. So. What, um, what this fellow has on is a pair of glasses that have a pair of webcams in them. And uh, he's interacting using a voice user interface to, to read something. Um, but again, it gets you a feel a little bit of, of how this might would go. Take picture. Read headline. Headline four. Growth and job speed system is seizing concerns. Private sector gains. Double hit seems less likely. Jobless rate of 1. Question 2 was how has Syria demonstrated that they are committed as to conservative Islam? 
they transferred people to other duties and they said that they were going to start supervising. Right. But, yeah. um. <laughs> so uh, how hard was it, how hard would you say it was to find the answers to the questions? Um, it really wasn't hard. I mean, you know, since I knew what to look for. Just so easy or fairly easy? Easy. Okay, so those questions at the end, those are the kinds of things that you're wanting to find out from people is how hard is this? Again, they're, they're very qualitative. Uh, you know, you use a, a, a simple scale, one, three, five, or something like that, high, medium, low. Uh, but it can give you a little bit of data uh, to help you decide these kinds of things. Okay, so in 15 minutes, We've got business concerns. <laughs> you want me to jump in more? When <laughs> Rob asked me to collaborate for this, because he wanted more of a cross-functional perspective, I have to confess that I represent the business side. So when we get to this part of the team, I was joking, this is one is like, and the business. We have to involve the business. Um, but the business is important, because otherwise you can have these amazing, talented people building these incredible, cool products that nobody buys and nobody wants. So it's part of this stool to get to these great great teams for products that are going to innovate and be accepted in the marketplace. So, you know, with the business, the concerns the business is bringing, you have your increased revenue, your retention, your customer satisfaction, we want our ROI, you know, how is this going to help me drive revenue? You know, it's so matter of fact, given my top line, my bottom line, you know, I want to know about this investment. But the reality is, in the business side, if you want to go to the next one, just like everything else, there's still that uncertainty. The risk doesn't go away just because I asked for a Gantt chart or a project report or an update. Um, and a lot of those tools we talked about earlier really just mask the uncertainty and give me a false sense of confidence. So what are we going to do about this? The business is a key area to where we need to tackle some of these processes of how we work head on. So. What we wanted to focus on in this business section is really for people who are working with the business, what can you do? If you're the developer, if you're the project manager, if you're the designer, how can we help the business better manage this to get them ultimately what they want? And a core thing that a lot of our projects that we've worked on together with um, my organization at Strategic Data Systems is we really work on focusing on business value. This is a language that the business understands. This is what they like to hear. But when it ties back to the user experience, you're focusing more on the goals. And why are you trying to do this? What's the value of this to you versus let's just list all the requirements of what we think we want, even though it may not even deliver or do what we want to do, which I think we've all experienced those projects to where you work hard, you deliver something, and as soon as they see it, they go, well, that's not what I want. That's not it at all. So. You know, a lot of this comes back to working with the, the business from a value-based approach. So there are just some highlights really directly taken from the Agile methodology and those principles and those tenets. So by focusing on business value, what does that mean? Well, it really means two big things with this integrated team, and that's working with the business differently. Um, making sure we have frequent reprioritization of requirements, making sure we're adapting to that change, we're focusing on what's most important, we're able to integrate in that new competitor that just showed up in the marketplace or that new technology or that new customer demand. Um, having short iteration cycles, making sure we're not trying to tackle the whole iceberg. Let's go through it chunk by chunk by chunk so we can learn as we go and we can prove that value. Have the highly skilled team, so let's make sure we have the UX people, the visual aesthetic designers, the best developers. Um, to tackle this project, but you also need strong business participation. These people have to come to the table and help out your team with their unique knowledge and their perspective as well. So, well, how do we do that? Because, you know, we've talked about it before, there's a mindset there, there's a process there that many of us, this can become a, a roadblock or an obstacle. So, one thing that we've found very successful is to build the business case, kind of go back to those same business concerns and how can we take our process and turn this into something that is tangible, is measurable and objective for them to assess value versus 40% done. So what we've done is we've, over the years, have 
done ongoing research with who's tracking metrics out there as well as tracking metrics for our project. And with our Agile approach, we found some common metrics that we tend to track just so we can show clients, hey, we know this process of how we're proposing to work differently works. And it's not just because it's fun, but it also is going to deliver you better results. And so if we're working with somebody in the business who their main driver is to reduce cost, we're going to work with them on case studies and metrics and track that project to show them how it's helping them reduce their costs. So if they have metrics that they've used with their approach, we can compare it to our approach. If uh, they don't have metrics, we can use benchmarks of what's out there in the industry or what we've benchmarked with other clients of ours. So a key thing with winning over people and working differently is showing them the business value, which is really clear when you're talking millions of dollars or years or months. If time to market is critical, I know this sounds new and different, but do you want to get it done in one third the time or do you want to just work as is and let's take three times as long to get there? So that tends to help people turn around and start to say, okay, let's try this and see what we get. So as you get business on board, their participation is really focusing on getting that frequent feedback because we want to fail fast. We don't have the time and we don't have the money to entertain something that's not going to fly. So what can we learn? What can we do differently? Uh, a lot of the short iteration cycles are all about failing fast so that you can move on to working what's right. And that's a very different mindset from how we tend to approach things. We're going to work it till we make it work <laughs> and not let it go. Um, but this is more about proving what works and then from there, especially with the developers or the team, that integrated team, using that frequent communication to go back to the business and one, show them that work is getting done. Because if you're working in a different way, there tends to be a lot of mystery and cloud there to where they think, well, you know, you haven't given me an updated spreadsheet or Gantt chart. Something must not be getting done. So going back and showing those demos for your shorter iterations and work cycles, you gain trust very quickly because they see like they haven't seen before that work is getting done. Um, you can adapt to their changing priorities. Once they see it, they'll say, well, no, it really shouldn't be that. It should be this. Or I was talking to this customer and I got this new bit of information. Can we have it do this? And Instead, if you're in those shorter work cycles and you can reprioritize, you can say, yeah, we can do that, instead of the 12-page document of, well, that's a change request. Let's not go there. Um, and then you have to be tracking your metrics for your business case. If you're going to convince business that if we work this way, we're going to get business done faster and we're going to be more productive, you have to track that in your own project. So not only are they experiencing it, but you can prove the metrics to them as well. One of the, thing, one of the exercises I was hoping we could do um, and we're not going to have time to do. This is something that I really like to run clients through is um, asking them to rate the stories or the requirements that we have uh, based on this chart. How important is it really to the business and how risky is it? And the goal would be to avoid this upper left quadrant, right? And to kind of work in that yellow line sweet spot. As you knock stuff out that's in that sweet spot, things that are in the upper left quadrant will start falling down into those and you will eventually get to everything that was initially laid out. But you want to focus on those things that provide the most business value as early up and uh, up front as, as early and up front as you can. So again, as another exercise, we're going to go through uh, some of that. This is, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Agile, this is a the top uh, one graph here is a burn down chart. So one of the comments that was made earlier was that management often doesn't have the insight that they're looking for in order to track or they're concerned about um, how to track what's being done and we have our Gantt charts and whatnot. Um, this is simply how much work were we planning on doing over the next two weeks? Uh, so that's where this 59 comes in on the upper left. And then we tracked throughout the two weeks how much work did we actually get done. And we were reporting that. Uh, we have tools that allow um, management to see that at any point in time, how much work is being done throughout that two week period of time. And then ev every four weeks we do a demo, as Stacy mentioned, where we're trying to, where we're showing what did we get done and get, that, get the business buy-in. This is, this is business feedback, not user feedback. 
but it allows them to give you that, um, make sure that you really are doing what's important to them. After you get some of these metrics done, uh, this bottom graph here is uh, what we use to project out. So in this graph, uh, a number of the, the stories or the requirements that uh, the team is working on may have been estimated by the team. Many of them have not been estimated by the team. So what we do is as things get estimated, they may get pushed back. We thought they were important, but then as time went on, we pushed them back. So these red lines here are showing uh, things that have been estimated. Um, and then the blue is showing things that are not estimated. And then um, we always kind of keep this idea of churn in there because things are changing throughout that period of time. So by measuring how much the team can get done, which is this constant red line here of team velocity, this team was at 92, um, what we call points, but basically that's how much work that team can get done during a period of time. You can begin to, to plan out now much more accurately when your system and that set of core requirements will be, be uh, completed. The estimated ones, um, which are the blue, uh, we just use an average across the number of stories that we have or the number of requirements that we have to uh, begin to determine. So this, these tools now begin to replace the, um, the traditional Gantt chart and the traditional uh, every week or bi-weekly status meeting where people are saying, how much did you get done? Um, as long as we define what done means, we can track done at the top on a daily basis and then we can also after we get enough uh, s enough work behind us we can begin to make good estimates uh, about the future. Any comments or questions on that? Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. Right. So as a so as a manager, you could ask that question. What happened? Because this is two weeks, right. right? So this is actually one day. It was January. I think that says January fifth and January sixth. Okay. So in one day, you dropped twenty some points. What happened? Well, what likely happened is that. The, in this, for this team, the definition of done is that someone other than a developer, more than likely a business analyst or QA type of person, tests a story and says, yes, that's done. So someone other than a developer is saying that it's done. So more than likely, uh, while they're all stuck at 42 there, the person who's responsible for testing is gone. She shows up on the fifth and gets a whole bunch of stuff tested in one day, and now it falls. But we're showing real time what's going on. So we're not gonna we're not gonna gradually draw that line down to the twenty-three. We're just gonna explain it away. We're gonna be transparent and explain to management that so and so was gone during that time. That was one of the primary challenges we had. Maintain quality, especially in distributed team Right. And so that yep. Yeah, so, so that's getting, that's, you're highlighting the importance of what is that definition of done and always keeping that in mind when you see these types of charts. Other questions? Uh, just a comment about risk. Uh, we regressed back to one of your earlier examples about Apple and uh, user experience being so uniform and ubiquitous across the brand. They have another level of risk that they don't. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it really depends on the context of where you're in the organization. Sure. And from sharing her perspective, it sounds like I'm trying to get this package in the traditional business model, but it's top down, and the business itself is not action, and do some of the processes of scale and nail it. They're not themselves looking at the market in a quick generation. Right. Well, and to your first point, um, often when I'm embedded into a team or a UX person like me is embedded into a team, we can be one of those testers. 
who is, who is saying whether something's done or not. So now you're building in the, the collaboration um, into that. And then, yeah, you're right. The, um, the idea of short iterations and, and all of that is um, difficult for larger businesses to understand. I've stopped trying to sell the idea because either they get it or they don't. And like the story that Doug told earlier with, the, with P and G, as big as they are and as process oriented as they are, they're starting to farm out these smaller things because they're seeing that this is a better way of doing things um, for that quick turnaround. So over time, hopefully, we'll be able to begin to make some breakthroughs. Okay, we are out of time. It's 1130. Um, I just want to run through this uh, last example here real quick. I mentioned this earlier about the whole Newegg thing. So this is what Newegg's uh, checkout uh, page looks like. Um, I went through a number of rounds of wireframing out different things and, and testing them. Um, in this round, this is more similar to the Amazon type of experience. This is a B2B uh, checkout experience, and so they want to be able to find a large number of addresses and, and uh, shipping and, and things. Uh, so there's, in these first couple of pages, there's parameters that be in an Amazon site. Um, when I, after going through that, users didn't really like that. So then I came up with this that I was all excited about, thinking you had on this top left one here, um, you had like a, a quick hit to five different addresses and all you had to do was click the number in your top five and you could go in and select your top five and configure it and, and that f if you hit one of those then it would show up over here. Um, yeah, users didn't like that either even though I thought it was so cool. I was so excited about it. Um, they, just, they just didn't. Um, so then we went to something that was a little bit more like Newegg but a lot more interactive uh, allowing it to do the, do the search um, so the, the touch type surf searching there in the upper right corner where they started typing three characters and then a list of addresses popped down, similar with cost center and then um, billing address information. Um, and so that's an, actually what users ended up liking more. And this is, so this is to replace the UI that I was talking about, or that I did the, UI, the usability study for earlier that I showed you where the girls stumbling around. Uh, for a long period of time. Um, we got it down into one page. <coughs> so you can see they start to type their search, it comes up. Uh, again, searching on cost center. So it takes them right to what, what's missing and the billing address. They start to type, it fills in, and they move on. So even though that's a little bit more complicated than what the Amazon experience is, people actually liked that better than the Newegg experience. Uh, so while it's similar, it's different enough and it accommodated them. And my point in wanting to sh run through this example with you guys is more to show um, how, that, how it builds. You know, we're iterating even in the UX, just as you're iterating as you de develop, just as you're iterating when you do visuals, right? You go in with your storyboards and, and you show people what, the, what a uh, system could look like and they're um, getting feedback and you keep iterating. We iterate through this as well. Okay, one last example. Um, this is for a system that uh, is supposed to track all of the signs in a, in a store. And you can just imagine for all of the speedways across America, the signs that go in those stores. Somebody actually has huge spreadsheets that manages all of that. And so we were working on a system to, to track that. Um, so here's the uh, Dugo map, part of the Dugo map for that system. Um, that we did, we did the wireframing, we got the visual folks involved. Um, we were working with a collaborative team. This is, uh, again, Agile. You can see the, uh, in the background there the storyboards with the um, stories, the yellow sticky stories on them. Uh, we've got metrics and other things uh, radiating there. Um, 
And this is a quick shot of somebody interacting with it. And I promise this is the last one. I know I'm five over. So you can see how they're interacting with it, some of the, the feedback there, the green around the edges and stuff. Um, all of that is when a whole co cohesive team comes together, you end up um, building something that, that stands out is a lot different than what most systems and sites interact with look like. So the, for that project in particular, um, we were, uh, yeah, just we had a good business sponsorship. We had a good integrated team. Um, we had 78% code coverage for those of, of you who are developers doing the TDD thing. Uh, we had 0.3 bugs per thousand lines of code, which is pretty much unheard of if you track that kind of stuff. Uh, waterfall methods usually get about um, 30 bugs per thousand lines of code. So, uh, Hopefully you kind of get an idea of how the benefits of all of these guys working together are. So that's, like I said, I'm sorry we're six minutes over, but we'll be around if you guys want to chat more.